Hello everyone, greetings from Sydney. Um, today I'm going to talk about a, uh, a trend that's emerging around the, uh, around the world in universities uh, that are interested in addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and uh, that, uh, that emerging theme concerns using social entrepreneurship projects and programs as part of the curriculum and research and engagement um, rather than, uh, for example, commercial entrepreneurship. So I'm going to focus on that. Um, uh, that's something that's happening at my university itself, Western Sydney University here in Australia. Uh, we, uh, we're giving a lot of attention uh, to engagement projects around the Sustainable Development Goals and looking at how we can develop uh, with our graduates um, the uh, capabilities that will fit them out to be work ready plus for an uncertain tomorrow, not, not just work ready for today. So. Um, what I thought I would do then is just quickly take you through um, uh, some of the themes that are that sit around that issue of sustainability in the curriculum uh, and the use of social entrepreneurship today, and I hope you find it useful. So I'll whip through this quickly. Um, you'll have the slides, of course, uh, available to you um, from the Copernicus team, um, but also there is a paper um, that uh, I've passed on already to Kate and colleagues um, and Ingrid that, uh, that actually uh, outlines what I'm about to say in a little bit more detail. So let's get kicking along. Uh, the first, uh, the first um, thing I want to actually raise is there's four themes. Um, and the first theme is uh, work ready plus graduates need opportunities to exp explore invention for social benefit in their studies. Um, and the, the second theme is that we need to focus on social, not just commercial entrepreneurship. And the third theme is that universities and colleges, I think, are ideally positioned to help their country address the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, here at Western Sydney University, uh, we've been working on that since about 2007. Uh, and uh, as a result of the, the work we've done here and uh, giving particular attention to that notion of engagement and social entrepreneurship, um, we were successful in the Times Higher Ed's impact ratings this year, being first in Australia and 11th in the world. Um, so I'm speaking to some extent from practical experience at my own university where I was uh, Executive Director of Sustainability and the Pro Vice Chancellor, um, but also from the work I've been doing around the world over the last two or three years as Australia's National Senior Teaching Fellow, looking at developing work ready plus graduates for an uncertain future. So I hope you find um, that uh, theme of interest. And the final one is we could talk about what we should do. However, uh, good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them are wasted ideas. And that's a recurring theme that came out of our studies of 193 um, successful sustainability leaders in universities a few years ago around the world for the Australian government. So that's the four themes. Uh, why should we bother uh, building social entrepreneurship into the curriculum and addressing the, in addressing the sustainable development goals? Well, first of all, ensuring the fitness of purpose, not just the fitness for purpose of our education programs is critical. Fitness of purpose means you could have absolutely useless outcomes, but everyone's really attaining them effectively. So the fitness of purpose is critical, and that's where we need work ready plus graduates for the uncertain future. Um, in the current context, therefore, we need graduates who are not only work ready for today, but work ready plus uh, that is capable uh, for an uncertain tomorrow. And what's the plus involved? It means being sustainability literate, change implementation savvy, inventive and creative, uh, and being clear on what your position is on the tacit assumptions driving the 21st century agenda. Because your values that you take from higher education will determine what you do when you are faced with the inevitable dilemmas of professional practice. So those tacit assumptions that we believe uh, to be work ready plus as a graduate, you need to have thought yourself through on and your own position on are things like growth is good, consumption's happiness, ICT is always the answer, and globalization's great. So. Uh, that's why we should be, I think, bothering more, and that's why certainly at my university and uh, the, uh, the the universities, the 160 universities I've worked with over the last three or four years as the Australian Senior Teaching Fellow have also thought um, that that idea of work ready plus is important. And so that leads us into this idea of social entrepreneurship being one way to help develop that inventiveness, that change implementation savviness, and that moral purpose, if you like, that resides within those tacit assumptions I've just mentioned. Now we know the goals, so we've got the 17 goals. The point I wanted to make about the, uh, about the sustainable development goals is of course for many years, um, we've been looking at those as the four pillars of sustainable development, social, cultural, economic, as well as environmental. And the four pillars all locked together, social, cultural, economic, and environmental. So if you have a look down those 17 uh, 
uh, those 17 goals, you'll see that residing with all of that in all of those goals are those issues of the four pillars of sustainable development, not just uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Although environmental, of course, interacts with social and cultural. Uh, and so they are actually interlaced, those, those four dimensions. They're not separate at all. And so social entrepreneurship, you can see, resides in a number of those goals uh, out of the 17 in many, many ways. And being socially entrepreneurial is one way in which universities can develop Work Ready Plus graduates who can actually enact, if you like, and deal with those really tricky situations and challenges that lie beneath the 17 goals that the United Nations has set for 2030. Um, now, the next issue, of course, is well, what is social entrepreneurship? Well, the point about that is economic entrepreneurship is, is a bit different from social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship has the moral purpose of addressing those goals um, around, if you like, an area that uh, needs to be addressed for social value for communities and people. So it's not commercial value, it's social value. However, social entrepreneurship uh, projects uh, always have to, in fact, look after income. The thing is, the income goes back to the scaling up the entrepreneurship project, the social benefit. It doesn't go into the pockets of the, uh, of the uh, shareholders. So that's why, of course, commercial entrepreneurship tends to be more about personal benefit and pro profit maximisation, uh, whereas social entrepreneurship is about benefiting others. But of course, you both want, they both want to make money, but with one of them, you take it out and give it um, to uh, the uh, stakeholders, to the shareholders, if you like, and the other one, you put it back into scaling up the service for more people. So there's a bit of a difference, I think, between social and commercial entrepreneurship. Now, there's piles of examples of social entrepreneurship, which I've, I've, I've put down in some detail uh, in that associated paper that I mentioned that I sent to Kate and Ingrid, um, which you can have a look at um, if you want to see details on this. But I'll just highlight just I've got a whole list here, but I'll highlight just one or two quickly. So in Sri Lanka, um, one of our colleagues here at Western Sydney University has invented an app on a very humble uh, smartphone that everyone has in Sri Lanka um, because no one has computers, but they, everyone has a, a smartphone some description. That app tells you as a farmer where uh, everyone, what everyone's planting in your area uh, so that you don't plant the same thing and then have a glut, which means no one makes money and food gets wasted. So it's a cunning way in which you can, as a local farmer, go onto your phone, stand on your land, work out what everyone else is planting, and then you're told by the app what you could plant on your land and how much it would cost you to, in fact, get your crop. Uh, that way, everyone plants something that's amenable to the land but is different, and that optimises the quality of the food and therefore food security. Sandik Ruit has created interocular lenses in Nepal for three or four bucks rather than 150 from the West. Um, uh, the spin effects is about nanocellulose in Australia and producing a, 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 a latex is 10 times stronger than current, and that's indigenous knowledge. Uh, the citrus farm in, uh, in Foscor uh, Development Trust up in South Africa is looking at ways of making money out of waste. Uh, I won't go through the rest of them. Uh, you can see there, all, each one of those is very interesting. You know, for example, you all know about fast fashion, but the, the pig farms in, uh, I was uh, working with the University of the South Pacific for quite a period of time. And over there, we take the pigs droppings in Samoa. We run them down a hill into a series of little dams using a solar pump of water. We grow algae on the dams. We feed the the algae to fish, we kill the fish and feed it to the pigs. So you've got a circular uh, economy there without having to spend a lot of money in carbon miles bringing in um, pig food from overseas. Um, and, uh, you know, you've, this university has been doing this for ages. We have our own living lab at Western Sydney. Uh, I, I nicked that from Harvard's living lab uh, with a colleague of mine who has worked there for many years, Leith Sharp. Uh, with whom I did that project I mentioned earlier about the 193 successful sustainability leaders in universities, along with Daniela Tilbury, of course, my good colleague Daniela, uh, and also Liz Dean um, from uh, when she was working at the Australian National Uni. Uh, the Enactus Social Entrepreneurship Projects, I'm sure you're aware of. In addition to that, of course, we've got uh, living, the Living Lab projects I've mentioned at Western Sydney University, including our River Farm project, uh, which is actually a living lab for Indigenous knowledge where local school kids come in and see how, what the foods that people ate 20,000 years ago by the river. But we also uh, use the river itself as a living laboratory on looking at the health of the river. Uh, we've got an old farmhouse which has been restored um, using uh, traditional techniques. So you've got a whole series of little exemplars if you like, for young school kids to see 
what sustainability in action looks like, social, cultural, uh, economic, as well as environmental. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, working in this way has led us to uh, come out reasonably well this year on the sustainability uh, impact ratings for the Times High Red Supplement. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about really is we are not alone. There are many networks that are working on social enterprise into the curriculum around the world uh, and social enterprise projects. And wouldn't it be great if we were able to in fact not just work within our own networks but network the networks. So I've listed a few of them here for you. Um, there's, uh, there's the Social Enterprise World Forum, last held in Christchurch in 2017, which was a wonderful, uh, wonderful gathering of people from around the world. There's the International Conference of Entrepreneurship Educators, where uh, I'm giving the keynote address this year, actually in Oxford, uh, on social entrepreneurship. Uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals. So the same thing I'm running through with you today. There's the Association of Commonwealth Universities. There's 500 of those. Uh, they are currently doing a stock take, if you like, of what's happening across those 500 members in the whole sustainability level, in, level uh, area, including uh, in terms of sustainability and social enterprise. You've got, you know about the Global Alliance of Universities and the International Association of Universities. There's also in the UK, of course, you've got the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, you've got the Social Enterprise Academy. Anactus, of course, has been doing great work on this for many years. Then, of course, my, uh, my good colleague, uh, Clemens Mather, of course, took me over a couple of years ago to visit uh, the Oikos team in St. Gallen. And then, of course, last but certainly not least, is your own network. So uh, if you see what I'm doing in terms of those four themes, what we're looking at is why bother uh, with social enterprise in the curriculum, the need to develop work ready plus graduates and how this can help. We're looking then at the way in which uh, we've already got lots of examples if we want to look at things that we could try out and do uh, and that to do that we need to network the networks. Um, Let's now quickly turn to, uh, quickly to just what the characteristics of a successful social entrepreneur are. This comes out of my research uh, with 3,700 learning and te le teaching leaders through that National Senior Fellowship on Work Ready Plus graduates. And uh, also from our research in 10 professions over the last two decades, uh, where we've looked at what distinguishes successful early career graduates. Um, and they are things like they have a clear moral purpose, they're always able to listen, link, leverage, and then lead in that order. Um, they actually approach people in a why don't we, not a why don't you way. And that's, of course, often been a lot of the problems with triple trying to convince others who aren't in the tent that they should change their behaviours. You've always got to start with the inside out, not the outside in. Uh, and they possess the, many of the uh, capabilities identified in our studies of successful early career graduates uh, in the, uh, those professions, including remaining calm when things go awry, tolerating ambiguity, being able to take sensible risks and persevere, to work productively and, uh, and empathise with diversity, to think laterally, to think ahead and adapt like a chess player, not just go blindly in and rigidly just do it. Uh, and then the idea of building and sustaining and working with productive networks, which is why I've mentioned in that previous slide, those networks that we've got. Um, and they've changed uh, the business and change implementation savvy. Now, what's a way of making sense of what I've just said? Well, the learning outcomes of our programs need to align with the sorts of outcomes we want for Work Ready Plus graduates. Uh, and that means we've actually got to be able to make sure we're covering not just competencies, skills and knowledge, but the capabilities like the ones I've mentioned in the curriculum and to have learning methods like uh, action research and social enterprise projects, working with community partners uh, and then the assessment to assess that. Um, so as I've said, uh, you, you've got your personal, interpersonal and cognitive capabilities. You've just seen some examples of those now in the little brief uh, summary profile I gave you of a successful social entrepreneur. Um, and uh, if you want to see more about that, have a look at our graduate, uh, successful graduate studies uh, where you'll get the framework. So just to recap then, what, we've, uh, what we're looking at then is the idea that we need social entre entrepreneurship in the curriculum to address many of the sustainable development goals, uh, that universities are uniquely positioned to do that. But to do that, we need to make sure we've got the right outcomes and the right learning methods and resources and assessment. Uh, and to do that, we need to understand what the destination for these graduates is. And that is for them to be work ready 
for today, which is competence, remember, but work ready plus for the uncertain tomorrow. And that, of course, is really critical because 95% of the world's leaders have a degree. So we want them to come out understanding their position on the tacit assumptions, understanding where they stand in terms of being sustainability literate, change implementation savvy, how to manage mad people, et cetera, uh, and inventive, and be able to think ahead and laterally, not just backwards and rigidly. Uh, and that, of course, is those four ones that's there for you again, the four things uh, I outlined that characterised the uh, Work Ready Plus graduate. Um, now, in terms of social enterprise in the curriculum, there's many examples. The United Nations Regional Centres of Expertise in uh, ESD uh, have universities often associated with them, and each of those are often doing work that really relates directly to what we could label as social entrepreneurship in the curriculum. Uh, we've got many universities, as I've said, using the campus as a living laboratory. Um, we've got uh, little initiatives that are taking place, like a social studio in, Mel in Melbourne um, for refugees who then actually run and make money out of the social studio for food and clothing, but they put that back into their education and they're actually studying and getting credentials while they actually make the social studio work. Uh, Sydney School of Entrepreneurship is looking not just at uh, commercial entrepreneurship, but at social. The Blue Economy, uh, I've mentioned many times before, that is really a critical resource in my view, and that's about making money out of waste. And there's hundreds of projects now underway around the world, of which that Foscor Development Trust one I mentioned briefly earlier, the Oranges, is an example. Uh, we have lots of experience, which I've mentioned in the associated paper of this on, the, on our, what we did to apply those characteristics of social entrepreneurship that I mentioned earlier to the Royal University of Phnom Penh when we were redeveloping it after it being completely destroyed by Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Uh, and then in Australia, we did many years ago now an audit of sustainability in the curriculum. It would be very useful to do an audit of social sustainability in the curriculum, I think not just within Australia, but across partners. Uh, and then you know about ACE and ACTS and, of course, your own selves. Uh, the technical and further education area is an area that's often ignored but does all sorts of interesting things around social entrepreneurship. Uh, and in the discussion paper, there's a whole big full list of those for you. So to move now to my fourth theme. So we've talked about, you know, what we might want, why we should bother with social entrepreneurship, how it will address the sustainability goals and enhance the position of universities interested in doing that the capabilities of Work Ready Plus graduates that we need that we can enact through social entrepreneurship um, projects. But that's all just ideas. The thing is, what do we do to make it happen? And that's, of course, my motto, good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them are wasted ideas. And there's, universities are wonderful at talking, but nothing actually happens on Monday. So then that, what came out of that study that I did with Daniela Tilbury, Leith Sharp and uh, Liz Dean, uh, looking at those 193 uh, sustainability leaders who were successful in universities around the world. It's called Turnaround Leadership for Sustainability in Higher Education, and it's referenced in the paper, um, is that good change doesn't happen, it must be led, but deftly, and good leaders of change always listen first, then they link together what they find, then they leverage what uh, they find some little groups are doing better than others uh, to scale it up and they get them to trial it out under control conditions and then lead at the very end, always in that order, listen, link, leverage, then lead, and lead is scaling up using those who've done the leveraging, those who've actually done the trialling, if you like, as peer mentors for those further back the path who want to get down the path. So therefore, you must start small and learn by doing and build on your successes. So the motto for making change work in this area and getting social entrepreneurship into the curriculum is always ready, fire, aim. Not ready, aim, 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 have a committee, aim, aim. It's ready, we'll have a go at it, fire, that's leveraging and trialling it under control conditions to see what works, and aim is what you find works. So that's the second lesson about making something happen on Monday. The third is always start with a stock take of what's already happening. This is a way in which you build, into, if you like, ownership into what's happening. One never should start by actually telling people what they've got to do or having a strategic plan and trying to sell it. This idea of selling strategic plans is never the way you do it. It's always, why don't we, oh, look what we're already doing, why don't we make that a little bit better? Um, and finally, of course, 
uh, identifying good practice across the networks, but using indicators of what's actually a powerful impact, which is why assessment's so important for this. You can't say, oh, this is a great social entrepreneurship project. If you can't answer the question, we know it's good because it is dealing with these outcomes. It is demonstrably developing um, graduates who are socially uh, uh, adept and who are sustainability literate, change implementation savvy, have demonstrably made something happen inventively in practice. It's a, and who are clear on their uh, value assumptions. Uh, therefore, one thing that I think uh, I'm talking to a couple of countries about now is developing a national clearinghouse um, on this whole area to save reinvention of the wheel. Uh, and I think uh, really promoting initiatives in this area uh, should be a national focus um, of uh, your national provision as a university to international students because international students, if one has a moral purpose, go back to actually develop the social, cultural, intellectual capital of their countries, not just the financial capital, as important as, of course, financial is as well. You know, you can't do things without money. Now, if you want further suggestions on what you do on Monday to make things happen, then in the Flip Curric site, which is the one that came out of their National Senior Fellowship, and I've given you the, the link to it there, uh, there's a whole lot of tips in the Making That Happen section in the Flip Curric site. Um, so that's it, really. Um, so in, in preparation for our... Uh, a virtual get together in September at the conference. Um, there's three things that I thought you might want to have a little think about if this makes sense to you and seems relevant. Is one aspect of the talk that one that you found particularly interesting, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what and if it, folks took anything of interest out of the talk. The second was one aspect you'd like to know a bit more about, and I think the third thing is really important given the networking potential for this. Is what's one initiative in this area you think the Copernicus Network should now pursue? So colleagues, I hope that's been useful to you. Um, and it's a quick run through, but remember you've got the backup paper and the slides themselves if you wanted to go back over the detail. My aim today was really just to give you a sense of how important I think uh, social entrepreneurship is and how there's a unique moment of opportunity now for building social entrepreneurship into the curriculum of universities like those in the Copernicus Network who are strongly committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. So I wish you all the very best and uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully having a natter with you uh, in September when the conference gets going um, over, uh, into, uh, virtually. Okay, all the very best and, and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>